announced. This conference will now be recorded. And I'm really pleased to be here today to facilitate this discussion on institutionalizing evidence use in Parliament of Ghana. We're going to be sharing reflections from the Data for Accountability project. Um, so I just wanted to outline a couple of quick housekeeping points before we kick off. Um, everybody is muted at the moment, so uh, we will ask you to stay on mute for now, um, but please do introduce yourself in the chat uh, if you'd like to. Um, and for the sake of bandwidth, we're going to have all of the panelists will have their videos on throughout the discussion, um, but we'll ask others to keep their videos off and would very much encourage you to use the chat box uh, to submit uh, questions and, and to say hello to everybody else. Uh, we are going to have a couple of uh, rounds of, of Q&A uh, for the panel, so looking forward to that interaction with you. Uh, also, just to note that we will be sharing a recording uh, within about 24 hours of the session, so by continuing to participate, uh, you're giving your permission to be recorded in the, uh, in the discussion today. Okay, so just wanted to provide a, a quick framing of the Data for Accountability project. Uh, as many colleagues uh, will, will know and appreciate, our comprehensive data for monitoring the progress of SDG implementation is, is obviously really important to enable parliaments to perform their oversight and accountability role effectively. So DAP is a project which helps Parliament of Ghana to use data to oversee progress towards the SDGs. The project is led by African Centre for Parliamentary Affairs, supported by INASP and the Ghana Stat Service and has funding from the Hewlett Foundation. It is aiming to build greater collaboration between data producers, in particular GSS and Parliament. And uh, it uses a range of specific uh, approaches to strengthen collaboration between data producers and Parliament. Um, so those that are familiar with evidence-informed policy work will recognize these different levels of capacity strengthening that the project is working on, uh, from training and mentoring uh, of MPs, of parliamentary staff, and of GSS staff, also piloting a constituency profile system, so really looking forward to hearing more about that today, to support representation. Uh, and establishing an SDG desk within the Parliamentary Research Department, as well as holding a data fair to connect producers of, of research and stats with users. So there's a range of capacity development approaches here, uh, working at individual, or organizational and at systems level. And uh, it's also targeting the oversight as well as the representation functions of Parliament. So uh, a really holistic approach within the project. So during a pandemic, of course, such as COVID-19, the need for evidence and data is, is more important than ever and is uh, front of mind for many of us. And there have been some challenges for DAP uh, working with MPs in a year that's been disrupted both by the general election in Ghana and the closure of parliament due to the pandemic. But DAP has been able to really take advantage of a key window of opportunity in the sector and make some really exciting progress. So really looking forward to hearing uh, more from our panelists today about the work of the project. It is the first focused effort to introduce data for SDG monitoring to any subcommittees in parliament. It has really strong parliamentary support from the minority and majority side and is the first partnership between a national stats office and parliamentary strengthening organization. So there's lots of things that are, that are really exciting about DAP and, and should be really interesting to hear about today for those of us that come from the evidence informed policy space, as well as those from the statistics and the parliamentary strengthening side. Uh, I would like to introduce our speakers today uh, before we kick off the discussion. Um, we have Dr. Rashid Raman, president and CEO of the African Centre for Parliamentary Affairs, ASAPA. Rashid has led many projects working with Parliament, civil society and other stakeholders, particularly in Africa and Asia, and has been actively engaged in institutional, parliamentary, PFM, evaluation and governance work for the past two decades. Uh, he's carried out pioneering work with more than 30 African parliaments and a total of 50 parliaments around the world. So really pleased to have Rashid with us today. Um, we also have with us Omar Saidu. Omar is a social statistician with uh, over 18 years of experience in the stats production process. He is head of demographic stats and SDGs coordinator for the Ghana Stats Service. 
where he champions data innovation and a multi-stakeholder approach to data production and utilization, uh, brokering strategic partnerships like, like this one and mobilizing resources for the stat system in Ghana. Uh, Omar is also a fellow of the sampling program for survey statisticians and a member of the UN interagency and expert group on the SDGs. Welcome, Omar. Also on the panel today, we have Abraham Ibn Zakaria. Dr. Zakaria is a senior research officer in the Parliamentary Research Department uh, with 14 years of experience in providing research service to committees, individual members and leadership of Parliament and uh, I know has also worked extensively on evidence-informed policy capacity strengthening projects in Ghana. Uh, Dr. Zak's research interest is evidence informed policy making in the legislature uh, alongside uh, land tenure security and public policy. Welcome to Dr. Zakaria. And I believe we are also expecting uh, Honorable uh, BT Baba, Benson Tongo Baba, Chairman of the Poverty Reduction Strategy Committee uh, at the Parliament of Ghana and uh, really Delighted to be expecting uh, Honourable Baba today. He is the NDC MP for the Talenzi constituency and has been involved in the DAP project. Um, I just want to check if we have Honourable Baba with us. We don't have a fourth video on. Um, Hopefully, uh, Honourable Baba will be will be uh, joining us soon. Um, so, just before we kick off the discussion, I just want to outline to to everybody how this is going to flow today. So, we'll have two rounds of discussion. A first round of discussion where I'll be posing some questions to the panelists, um, and they will be responding. And then we'll have time for some audience questions and, and input after that. And then there'll be a second round to hear from the uh, speakers. And, and then another audience questions and input round after that uh, before we wrap up. And uh, as part of the wrap up, all of the speakers will be invited for some kind of final last words. Um, so I would like to kick off then with uh, a question for Rashid. Um, how do you think, Rashid, that general overarching issues around evidence production and use in Parliament, how do they apply specifically to data for the SDGs in Ghana? Thank you very much, uh, Emily. A very good morning to uh, all our uh, participants and then my, my co-panelists. Uh, perhaps maybe let me just uh, take a step back and, uh, and provide a bit of history. So at least uh, those that are not familiar with, with the Parliament of Ghana and the work that we have been doing around evidence could understand uh, what is currently being done and the focus on, uh, on SDGs. Um, um, many years ago, we did work uh, with, um, with INAS to try and build a, the capacity of um, the research department of the Parliament of Ghana in particular around issues of uh, evidence and how uh, they could produce evidence to inform the general work of, uh, of Parliament. In other words, supporting all the key committees, particularly those that are involved in or at the forefront of oversight work. Uh, that was um, work that built on uh, previous um, engagements that we've, we've done with um, the research department of the Parliament of Ghana with support from, from Star Ghana. Uh, for those who don't know, Star Ghana um, is a multi-donor uh, um, basket fund that uh, supports the work of civil society organizations and and, uh, and parliament. So in other words, uh, demand and supply side of, uh, of accountability. So we did some work with Star Ghana and then built on it with work um, with, um, with INASP. Uh, in the case of the work with INASP, it was part of a three country initiative, um, Ghana, uh, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. Now building on that, um, we are now uh, implementing a project as uh, Emily has introduced uh, that we call DAP, Data for Accountability. And in this uh, particular project, we are 
uh, it's a kind of tripartite partnership. Um, ourselves as SEPA as a lead, and then we have the Ghana Statistical Service, and then we have INAS, um, that's where Emily, Emily works. And what we've been trying to do under this, uh, of course, keeping in mind the overarching um, issues surrounding uh, data production uh, and use within the Parliament of Ghana, we have been trying to shift and change the narrative um, to have a focus. Of course, that's the focus of the project. The project is focused on SDGs. And we've been trying over the last uh, two or so years to shift the narrative so that the focus of uh, evidence and data, uh, particularly as it relates to what we do together with our partners, is focused specifically on SDGs. Um, if we step back again, even looking back to previous work uh, and looking back, uh, looking at um, the nature of the SDGs, everything that we do in our country, as well as most developing countries, I think uh, revolve around issues of SDGs. Uh, the SDGs, if you like, were, uh, were framed, I think, to deal with issues in developing countries. So I mean, data, evidence, and any support that is being provided to our parliament, as well as most other parliaments on the continent, I believe um, the focus, um, even if it is not uh, explicitly um, said, the focus is on how to help um, these, these countries to attain uh, the targets that are set in the SDGs. But specifically for us, um, we've tried to shift as I said earlier, the, the narrative, so that it's not evidence in general, but in this case, we are dealing with evidence that will support um, the, the Parliament of Ghana and its committees and our country to achieve, achieve the SDGs. Uh, and um, as Emily indicated, we have uh, been working very, very closely with the Committee on Poverty Reduction, which is tasked with the responsibility of looking at issues around poverty in our country and all the issues uh, around the SDG. So that's one way in which um, we have tried to shift the narrative. We have also tried to, together with um, the Ghana Statistical Service, uh, set up um, and institutionalize a relationship between that institution, which has a mandate in our country to produce uh, data and evidence and, and uh, be the repository of evidence to uh, ensure that you know data is provided to people like Dr. Zakaria and uh, in the research department, as well as the various committees of parliament, so that when they do their work, uh, at least whatever they do is informed by by data that is SDG specific, uh, so that hopefully if there is uptake, our country can can uh, attain the, 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 the I mean, SDG targets and goals that, that, that have, been, have been set. In addition, um, the other thing that we have done uh, as part of changing the narrative and, and shifting the focus is um, to establish uh, a liaison kind of uh, relationship and a, an SDG desk within the Parliament of Ghana uh, which is supposed to be, uh, you know, the the place for MPs to go to uh, to I mean um, pick up data that can help them to do their 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 oversight work and also to focus uh, mainly on how uh, to help our country achieve the the sustainable development goals. Now, um, I decided to give this background before perhaps going back to some of the big issues around data production and, and update uh, and, and, and use, if you like. Now, I think uh, maybe let me start with um, some of the issues around production. Uh, and I think for the sake of time, I'll be very brief here. And I'll mention just uh, three issues. I mean, there, 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 there is, first of all, the issue of uh, data integrity. So for members of parliament uh, to use data, whether it's for SDGs or in general, uh, I think integrity issues are critical. 
particularly because it's a political house, I mean, made up of, uh, you know, in our country, made up of two sides. And uh, depending on how the data is viewed, uh, if you are not careful, the data can be labeled as being political. So that is why the issue of integrity is key. Uh, I think the second issue is uh, the issue around capacity. And I think that is uh, not a very difficult issue. We've been working uh, with uh, our colleagues in parliament, as well as working with uh, with MPs over the years. So that is not a, a very big issue. Then the third, and building on these two, is trying to instill the culture of evidence uh, generation uh, within um, within our our parliament. So I think um, on the side of production, maybe these are some of the critical issues that I wanted to highlight. On the side of use and uptick, I think um, uh, being a political house, we are not naive that uh, you know once you generate data and it's good, uh, integrity is, uh, is checked, uh, and there's capacity uh, to understand and so on, then it's going to be uh just uh, used by by members of parliament no sometimes you know politics stands between them and the and the use of uh, of data even if it's if it's good uh, data um then the 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 second issue that i want to highlight here in terms of use and uptake is the format in which i mean the data and evidence is, is provided to members of parliament um, you know, these are people who wake up every day and they walk into parliament and they have to deal with issues from from A to Z. I mean, there is no limit to what issues they can they can consider. So often, um, if you have evidence, you have very important information. If it's not presented in a in a format that I mean uh, can make them easily understand, apart from the fact that they deal with uh, all kinds of issues, they also don't have any specific uh, academic or capacity requirements to be members of parliament. So you find a whole range of, uh, of, of people with different capacities and so on and different levels of understanding. So it's important that uh, the format in which uh, data is, is, uh, is presented is, uh, is, is important. And then the, the last issue uh, that I want to highlight here is the issue of capacity. I mean, was an issue with um, uh, production, it's also an issue with um, with uptick. I mean, how do you get them to understand and appreciate uh, not only maybe the format in which it's produced for them to uh, to easily read and understand, but also how do you get them to appreciate uh, the fact that this is going to help them, uh, first of all, in their careers, but also to help them uh, help our country achieve uh, the sustainable development goals. So I, I think, Emily, I'll stop here just um, for the sake of time. But I, I hope I have uh, provided some some background and history and, and where we are uh, currently. I, I believe my colleague Omar would, uh, will speak more to some of the specific issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashid. And um, just to recap for those who have recently joined us, I uh, saw so a few people coming in while Rashid was was speaking. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm Senior Program Specialist at INASP, and we have with us uh, Rashid Draman from the African Centre for Parliamentary Affairs, Omar Saidu from the Ghana Stat Service, and Abraham in Zakaria from Parliament. Uh, unfortunately, Honourable Baba um, from the Poverty Reduction Strategy Committee in Parliament is not able to join us today. He's unwell and, and uh, sadly unable to join the roundtable. And, and the next question was going to be more about the specific challenges that are associated with the access to and use of data by that particular committee and, and the work that DAP has been doing with that committee. Um, I wonder, uh, Dr. Zakaria and, uh, and maybe Rashid uh, to follow up as well after uh, Dr. Zakaria, is there a sense that you can give us, a, um, maybe not particularly speaking for this committee as we don't have a uh, chairman with us, but is there a sense you can give us of some of the typical challenges that committees experience in Parliament, uh, in your experience, some of the typical challenges that they have with using data 
to understand uh, the, the picture of the SDGs in Ghana. If there's a couple of examples you can give us of typical challenges that you find in your work with uh, parliamentary committees, that would be great. Dr. Zakaria. Right, thank you, Emily, for, for, for the question. Uh, let me also thank <coughs> the participants and then uh, fellow panelists who are here uh, to discuss this issue. Let me thank Dr. Rashid for, for the exciting you know, background that he has given. It appears he's made my job very simple. Uh, yes, uh, usually the, 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 we have challenges when it comes to sometimes providing uh, evidence to committees and then some other you know, areas. Uh, uh, if you look at the generation aspect, as uh, Dr. Rashid uh, mentioned, uh, the, the data generation or data gathering department or institutions or structures in parliament, uh, initially we had challenges with capacity as he indicated. And in terms of capacity, we usually talk about numbers and then the scale mix. And so if you can imagine that you have 275 members of parliament, and then you also have about 16 select committees, and then we had just nine research offices. That is an, a capacity issue. So if every committee is supposed to have a researcher, then you can imagine that some other committees would actually go without, you know, research offices. And so such committees will always have, you know, challenges getting the kind of data that they want to, to work with. Then by the same token of the numbers, sometimes you find that researchers are placed on committees where they usually don't even have the expertise. We all come from different backgrounds, and then we thought we could have a very good skill mix to be able to meet you know, the taste and demands of all committees. But because of the shared numbers, that has always been you know, an, an issue with providing you know, uh, evidence to support you know, committees. Then if I want to look at the optic side, the optic side, the politics one he mentioned is very, very key. Uh, the little uh, evidence that you provide to committees are, are subject to you know, a political test. Because when your data or your information uh, doesn't meet you know, the test, particularly the chairman, because the tradition is that when you are sending evidence to a committee, it must go through the chairman. The chairman must take it the leadership might look at it and then allow the other members to, to use it. Unless you put it on the website for every member to go for. But if you submit it to the committee, you, you didn't have that challenge, you know. And then we also have this issue of the timing, the timing of the, the, the provision of the, the data, the evidence to the committees. Most of the times, the request for data or for any information to support committees can come just last minute. And it becomes very difficult for the researchers to be able to put together, you know, a very, very concise, a very, very, you know, comprehensive information for, for, for the committee. Uh, one of the areas that we do provide evidence to support committees is when there is a budget before the, 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 the house. And then these budgets are referred to the committees. Sometimes the committees want the research team to do some analysis of, of these and provide some evidence. And sometimes the, 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 the budgets, the sector budgets are referred to the committees. Then the next day, the committees say they are meeting. And it takes a long time. You cannot just use one night to analyze a whole sector budget and provide all the things that are needed for the committee to be able to
to, to make use of this. And so these are some of the challenges that we usually face in terms of generating you know, data, in terms of uh, providing an you know, uptake. We also have this issue of you know, uh, access because the research department, which is the main you know, data providing device doesn't generate, you know, the kind of data that are needed just within the department. We, we rely on data uh, or information produced by think tanks, by uh, other institutions that are outside parliament, like the GSS and then others. Now, in the past, there, there had been this gap between us and the data, data generators. You know, research departments did not collaborate adequately, properly, with these data generating institutions, so that we can always have access to the information, access to data as and when it is ready. So you find that as we were grouping in the dark looking for information, the information were always somewhere, and they are also not aware that we have even a structure in Parliament that we can access these uh, data. But for some of these things, I would say that they are becoming a turn of the past. You know, for now, in terms of the capacity, in terms of numbers, that's this year, Parliament has recruited a lot of staff. We have increased our numbers from the nine that we used to have to about 25. And so we are hoping that, you know, that capacity issue will be a thing of the past. Then in terms of, you know, the collaboration, you know, under the project, uh, the DAC project, we are seeing a very close collaboration between the research department and the GSS. And then we are talking. We now have this issue of placement where research officers will be placed under uh, other think tanks, other experts within the GSS so that we can collaborate and then pick information quickly as and when it is done. We've also been talking about establishing the SDG data, which we've gone far, we've gone far with that. And I think that is one of the areas that can make data, you know, available in the research department. So that even on short notice, the information can be provided to the committees for, for use. So I will end, I'll stop here and then uh, probably we can take the discussions better as we go on. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Zakaria. Really interesting backdrop there emerging around these general factors that affect production and use of, of stats and other forms of, of evidence in the parliamentary context in Ghana. I'm, I'm hearing the mention to timing, to access, uh, to capacity uh, in staff numbers and in skills, and also the importance of relationships, which we know is a really critical factor in general for parliaments and how they, they use evidence. Um, and great to hear about the progress that you're seeing through the DAP project on, on that front. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Omar um, if, if you could come in next, Omar, and, and outline what you think DAP tells us about democratic accountability and why that's important for the SDGs in Ghana. Uh, we know that DAP has a specific focus on using statistics uh, in order to strengthen oversight of the SDGs. So what does that tell us about democratic accountability? Thank you, uh, Emily, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to um, my co-panelists and um, the others on the platform. Yes, um, effective democracy is all about accountability. Uh, that is uh, the responsiveness to the society, the people, and the environment. And as we understand, the SDGs represent the aspirations of the people. Uh, the SDGs is nothing more than what our countries individually have all this while been seeking to do uh, because it is it has been through this process it has been uh, the responsibility of every government to ensure that um, they eradicate poverty 
people have access, children have access to school, everybody ha has access to healthcare, um, uh, everybody has access to water. And so if you look at it from that perspective, as the SDGs is the aspirations of the people. Uh, but then um, this is the, the, the first time consciously that the UN has put it together uh, for all countries uh, of the globe, uh, not just uh, uh, for developing countries like in the MDGs. So uh, being able to meet this aspiration of the people, uh, it means that parliament uh, that will represent the people need to understand the people and they need to understand the environment in which the people live. So the data for accountability, which you already indicated, uh, seeks to be the connector in this case uh, by ensuring that parliament better understands the people they represent and the environment within which these people live uh, so that they can better represent the people and also provide some kind of accountability uh, through uh, the institutions that have been set up to provide social services. Uh, to the people. So the data for accountability basically is to ensure that the aspirations of the people are met, but that is the only way uh, effective democracy can be achieved. So through that, the data for accountability uh, is ensuring that um, we are able to provide some kind of evidence uh, to parliamentarians to understand the people they are representing what are demo the demographics of the people you are representing as a parliamentarian, for instance? What has been, uh, uh, for instance, enrollment in, 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 in the area that you are representing in terms of basic enrollment at a basic level, at a senior high level? How have children been able to transition from the primary school to the junior high school to senior high school? What has been the trajectory? And if, if we continue on that trajectory, how does it mean uh, for, for, for the development of the area? So this kind of evidence is what the DAP seeks to provide to members of parliament to understand their people. Then the other flip of it is, as you understand the people, uh, institutions like the Ghana, uh, like the education service, like the health service, the water and sanitation authorities, budget yearly and receive uh, taxpayers' money to provide services to the people. How have they been able to do that for the benefit of the people? So through data, these can be better understood so that the oversight rules of parliamentarians can be better uh, 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 achieved. So these are basically are the things that the data for the accountability uh, has been seeking to achieve understanding the needs of the people through data, understanding the environment of the people through data, and ensuring that these needs translate into outcomes that benefit the people. And at the same time, ensuring that we meet the aspirations without compromising the environment for the future of our children. So basically, this is what the Data for Accountability Project is doing. And we have been able to do a lot of work in all these spheres within the period. And I'm sure that as we proceed on the discussion, many of the things will be mentioned. Uh, Rashid already touched on a couple of them. And, and this is the first time we have consciously put together data um, uh, for members of parliament to help them uh, uh, better represent their constituents and also uh, to demand accountability from social service providers like the line, the, the, the various line ministry in relation to the service delivery of the, those areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar, and, and uh, thank you for reminding us and, and, and making the link for us of the importance of data, both for the representative functions of parliament and the oversight functions. And, um, also the exciting piloting of the constituency profiles, um, which we'll be hearing uh, more about. I can see that Josephine is posting questions in the chat. Thanks very much, Josephine. We will come back to the questions in the Q&A session and others, if you have questions, please do 
uh, follow Josephine's lead and, and post those into the chat and we will be sharing them with the panelists uh, as part of the Q&A. Um, the last question that I wanted to ask before we open up to the Q&A actually speaks to, uh, to Josephine's comment there, um, which is to ask Omar, um, and, and maybe Dr. Zach, you could come in on this after Omar uh, comments. Uh, what do you, what do you think that we can learn from DAP about the relationship between official stats bodies and parliaments? So we know that uh, that DAP had this unique window of opportunity, um, a sort of opening in the SDG structures in Ghana, as well as uh, uh, some reforms in the stat service and an interest in parliament in, in evidence use. And DAP has brought together, I believe, for the first time, an official partnership between Ghana Stat Service and Parliament of Ghana to work on evidence use at this intersection. Um, so what do you think that others can learn about this relationship uh, that has been growing between GSS and Parliament? Um, and maybe if you can mention when you're outlining as well, I, I know that there are formal kind of on paper aspects of that relationship and there's also a growing informal relationship and, and uh, growing sort of trust uh, as well. So maybe you could uh, speak to, to both of those things when you're outlining. And then as, uh, just after these comments, we'll open up for some Q&A. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, so um, what is refreshing for every statistician is to see evidence moving to impact. Uh, by providing evidence, you would want to see that it helped change uh, uh, some social interventions or it helped address some kind of uh, social policy. Now, um, the Data for Accountability project is the first time in the history of the GSS that we have had an opportunity to engage the entire leadership of parliament in a single platform. Uh, we have had the opportunity of meeting with the speaker of parliament, the majority leader, the minority leader, and the clerk of parliament. And this in itself provides an opportunity to engage and to understand the needs of parliament and understand the needs of the national statistical system that is being coordinated by the Ghana Statistical Service. And that provides an opportunity to, to establish a relationship on how the major producer of data in this country can meet the needs of the major user. Because if, uh, uh, from the first question you asked, if we understand that for us to have good governance, uh, mm -hmm. we need to have the responsibility and, uh, sorry, the, 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 the responsiveness of the government institution. And so if the major user and the major uh, uh, provider of data are able to engage seamlessly in a way that um, let data uh, influence or impact the evidence or decision making, then that is one of the greater things. And for me, that provided us the biggest opportunity. Now, through this, uh, we have been able to clearly establish uh, what we call uh, a window of opportunity. But for the first time in the history of GSS, the government statistician was given the opportunity okay, uh, to, to, to address parliament at the start of the 2021 population and housing census. In the past, the government statistician has had opportunity of going to parliament, but that is when uh, you, are, you are invited to respond to something or when um, uh, uh, you, you have to respond to some budget queries or some other uh, engagement. But for the first time in the history of, uh, uh, of GSS, um, uh, proactively, the government statistician was provided a platform to come and address parliament on the census. And that is one of the achievements of, of this particular uh, uh, program. Now, as uh, Dr. Rashid mentioned earlier, uh, we have also had opportunity where for the first time an SDGs or a statistic desk has been officially established within the research department of parliament to provide an opportunity for uh, the GSS 
and uh, uh, the research department of parliament to interact and engage by ensuring that uh, evidence move from the producer's choice to, to the user. And you know, it's interesting, as we started this engagement, uh, we have had the opportunity uh, for um, a committee of parliament to invite GSS to be part of an orientation for the parliament, that committee of parliament. It's never happened. And, and exactly a week ago, uh, the government statistician and myself had the opportunity of uh, um, uh, being invited to uh, join the parliamentary uh, uh, committee to provide an orientation on poverty and inequality in the country. And if this continues, this provides an opportunity for them to better understand their data needs, uh, for us to better understand their data needs, and they understand the challenges we have in providing data to them. And through this engagement, uh, we just returned from a trip with members of parliament, where uh, the, parliament, the, the, the uh, parliamentary committee um, uh, wanted to understand how evidence use uh, at the local governance level is done, how um, the district assemblies use evidence in their budgeting and in their project implementation. So the, 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 the Committee of Poverty Reduction Strategy in of Parliament uh, it, it, with ASEPA and uh, GSS embarked on this field trip in one of the regions of Ghana uh, last week, where the parliamentarians engage with the district uh, we call them DPCU, the District Planning and Coordinating Unit, which is the heads of all the um, uh, local or, or decentralized departments in the district who have the responsibility of planning and providing social services to the population. And it's again met with at the local level parliamentarians, which are uh, uh, the district, uh, the, the, the assembly members who kind of are the political leaders of the district. And this opportunity would never have been possible without this platform. And for me, this is the first and most important uh, uh, outcome of, of, of the entire engagement of that, because that is what we are seeking to do, to ensure that there is the use of evidence, not only in parliament, but also by the other arms of government. And this can only be institutionalized if the legislature which is overseeing the work of the executive is deeply uh, uh, involved in this and, and, and want to ensure that that remains uh, a, a blueprint within the structures of, uh, of the country. So for me, these are uh, some of the things where I would say that the relationship between official statistics and parliament has been very good. And it, it is something that uh, as we see now, we believe uh, we're going to grow stronger because informally, some members of parliament uh, have even reached out to some of us that, look, we want you to develop the same constituency profiles for our constituencies. An example is when we went, for instance, to the Upper East last week. Now, when we had an engagement with the district uh, uh, assembly members, for the first time, they were seeing data about their own district been presented to them for um, a five year, six year period, which they never knew. And this data was data that is collected already in the district. But consciously, this data has not been put together. Okay, uh, it, 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 it kind of draws some kind of insight. What has been the growth or what has been the, 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 the development in terms of uh, reduction in maternal mortality, reduction in, in, in uh, children, uh, uh, infant mortality. Uh, improvement in, in vaccinations. And for the first time, when they were faced with this kind of reality, then they said, look, we have been shooting in the blindly. It means that we need to do things differently. And for me, this is what the Data for Accountability Project is about. And I believe that mm -hmm. as we continue to engage, we would be able to get uh, much more results with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Omar. Um, I, I understand, Rashid, that you have uh, some limited time with us today. So uh, I hope you don't mind, Dr. Zakaria, if we switch up the order a little bit. I'd like to invite Rashid um, to also make a comment on what can be 
learned from uh, about the relationship between stats bodies and, and parliaments from DAP. And then, uh, and then we'll have a, a comment from the parliamentary side on that relationship. And then uh, looking forward to opening up to questions after that. Rashid. Um, Emily, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity once again. Um, you know, I want I want maybe uh, the participants to just pause for a minute and think about, you know, how how parliaments work. I mean, not only our parliament in Ghana. Uh, talk about Uganda. Talk about uh, all the countries that are that are represented here. Um, we all know that parliaments. Um, would continue to do their work every single day, whether you give them good data and evidence or not. So most of the time they will pass laws, uh, they will vote the budget and so on. They are not waiting for anybody. So I think we need to establish this very, very clearly. Uh, so in most cases, in most of our countries, I mean, bad laws are passed, Budgets are passed that are not informed uh, by reality, and so on and so forth. What we have been trying to do, particularly uh, with the relationship between GSS and uh, Parliament, is to, if you like, introduce a revolution in terms of how uh, um, Parliaments work. Make sure that you know you orient them in the direction in which I think they get to a point where they would always want or be hungry for data and evidence, I mean, at every stage in the in the piece of work that they do, whether it is, I mean, lawmaking, whether it is representing their people or whether it's holding the government to account. Uh, I know this is not going to be uh, an overnight affair. I mean, it's going to take a very long time. And as Omar said, before this project, you know, and I believe maybe that 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 might be the case in in most other countries uh, across the continent. That formal relationship, uh, an institutionalized one between Parliament and the official data generating body. Um, did not exist, at least in our country, and and I can dare say in in most other countries. So, what we are learning from this is that, look, sometimes in most countries, when the data producing body, which is supposed to be independent, comes out and says inflation is uh, in double digits. Contrary to, for instance, what the government of the day is saying in order to polish its image and so on, then you see a clash between uh, uh, parliament and, if you like, maybe the political party that has power with the data generating institution. In this effort, what we have been trying to do and what we are learning is that slowly parliament is beginning to understand how this data, uh, all kinds of data, uh, are generated by the data generating body and we are also trying to make sure that parliament becomes part of the conversation that eventually generates the data so that whether you are in opposition or you are in power the revolution we have started is to make sure that at the end of the day when the data is presented to you uh, you take it as data that has a lot of integrity you take it as data that uh, you can work with, even if uh, it, it's, uh, it stands at the opposite side of, uh, of where, you know, your ideology and, and your priority uh, as, as a country and so on stands. In the past, we have had in our country situations where the government statistician will come up with, with his data and then you hear political parties, particularly those in opposition, at least I can cite a few instances that will say no. This data is is not correct. This data is not uh, is not true, and so on and so forth. We want to change the narrative, and I think if you get the buy-in, as Omar said, of uh, the leadership of Parliament, and slowly you are able to orient members of Parliament 
towards the, the culture of relying on evidence to do their work. I think this narrative can change, and I believe that that would be a very good example for for you know many countries uh, across across the continent, because today. In our country, as well as in, in, in many other countries, sometimes uh, maybe because of uh, perhaps lack of orientation and because of maybe the uh, personal and party interests of uh, members of parliament, you end up having them relying on data that is very, very dated. I mean, maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, data which is used to inform decisions. When Omar and I and the government statistician went to see our Speaker of Parliament, who um, um, in his past uh, life was a Minister of State about 10, 15 years ago, he told us something that was very telling. He said when he was Minister for Housing, the data that he used to inform the housing policy and development uh, in general in our country was the same data that members of parliament uh, are quoting today when they get up to make arguments in terms of how to shape policy in our country. And he says that this is wrong and if this doesn't change, then you know we are always going to have it wrong because if your policy is based on wrong assumptions and wrong data, and I think that that is the narrative that we are trying to change. And that is where we are seeing the benefit of the relationship between uh, a statistics generating body and a uh, parliament. And I think that there are lessons, I believe, for most of the countries that are represented here. Thank you. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, Dr. Zakaria, do you have uh, any, any quick comments to add on the relationship between parliament and the stat service, um, particularly maybe uh, if I can jump into the questions section, maybe you could respond to Josephine's question uh, in your comments. Um, she was asking whether there is uh, consideration of an MOU with such institutions. Um, so if, if you could uh, answer that question, that would be great. All right, thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I, I can say about this relationship, <clears throat> a lot has been said about Omar and, and uh, Rashid, is when the idea to establish the SDG DEX in the research department came up under the project, we in the research department welcome it and we're happy about it because it offers an opportunity to, to access information from the right source, to interact with the right people. Now, when the, the, the idea was sent to our leaders, the Speaker of Parliament, the Clerk to Parliament, the re reaction was that this is a fantastic idea. We should not just limit it to SDG data, but let's expand that DEX to what we call a data center. Now, this was coming from our bosses. They said, we should expand it because having the SDG as SDG DEX problem and limit us to only data related to SDG. But we need more. We need more of such relationships. We need to have all kinds of data coming from anywhere apart from GSS, SDGs, and whatever, coming from academia. And then the next thing was that, fine, you cannot move from there if we don't have an MOU with all the institutions that generates data. And that, this getting an MOU with all the institutions that generates data is enshrined in our strategic plan. We are required, it's one of the key strategic things that we have to do as a research department, that we have to sign MOU with all data generation institutions so that they can always you know give us the data that we we need the second thing is that with the establishment of the data center and with our relationship with gss one of the things that research department is learning is that 
GSS staff, the experts, are now training staff of the research departments on how to handle their data. Because they don't, they are not supposed to just give us data they have analyzed. They have to give us raw data. The research department need raw data from GSS so that as and when members or committees request any information, we should have somebody who has the technical know-how to analyze this data and then get the kind of information that the, the member or the committee needs. And so currently, one of the things we are learning is that GSS staff constantly, they are training us on how to handle them, what kind of data they have, what kind of data they generate, and how to handle it. And they are also asking us that we should also be looking at the data they give us and see the gaps. If we find that there are certain information that the house needs, which we cannot get from their data, we should draw their attention to it so that in their subsequent data collection, they will have those you know, ones be part of the questionnaires so that they can improve upon the data that they have. So it's now becoming a two-way issue. Whilst we are benefiting from them, they are also seeking to see how we can assist them to improve upon the data that they collect. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to ask Omar if you would like to respond to this one uh, from Sam Hollingworth. In light of DAP, can you make some comment on the recent World Bank report data for better lives, uh, drawing on insights from DAP? And Rashid, if you have uh, a couple of minutes before we lose you, I wonder if you might be able to respond to the one from uh, Kirchhoff's, what mechanisms has DAP put in place to sustain this relationship uh, beyond the close of the project? What's the sustainability approach? And please do, uh, the, uh, those who are listening in, please do continue to post your questions in the chat box and we'll pick them up. Uh, Rashid, would you like to go first if, you're, if, if you need to leave us? Okay, all right, let me, let me go first. Uh, and in fact, great. Yes, that's a very, um, that's a very important question from Ketchups and uh, and that is usually one big challenge. Uh, we have seen many, many projects uh, in different parliaments that have ended and then, I mean, gone away with all the things that uh, that they, they have they have done. Uh, but we have also seen, uh, at least in my experience with the Parliament of Ghana, uh, many initiatives that we started many, many years ago, and today they've become a feature of, uh, of the Parliament of Ghana, even beyond the lifetime of the project. The one important lesson um, for me, if you want to uh, ensure and guarantee sustainability in most of these uh, initiatives, is that uh, at least you have to accompany Parliament for a little while, sometimes maybe two or three legislatures. So uh, we started that in the seventh Parliament. And thankfully, I think, uh, thanks to the generosity of uh, of the Hewlett Foundation, uh, we made a very strong argument because of uh, all the challenges that everybody faced uh, in the last couple of years and so on, and because of the fact that we want to make sure that, you know, this is really, you know, um, uh, if you like, uh, you, I mean, adopted um, by the Parliament of Ghana. Uh, they've generously agreed to allow us to continue this project throughout the lifetime of uh, of the eighth of the eighth parliament of our country. So I believe this provides us a very important opportunity to ensure that you know the elements that make for sustainability uh, perhaps are able to be realized. And what are some of these elements? I think you. First of all, in a parliamentary development project, you have to make sure that, I mean, just like in any other project, you have to make sure that, you know, the, the beneficiaries really see the benefit of the support that is being provided. And uh, given some of the reactions that we are getting, we had a data fair, Omar referred to it, uh, at the Parliament of Ghana, we did constituency profiles, uh, the speaker himself was there and appreciated that and uh, all the discussions that we've had 
between the government statisticians, the Speaker of Parliament and the leaders, I think we are getting the top hierarchy uh, to begin to appreciate the importance of data uh, in the work uh, of the Parliament of Ghana and to uh, perhaps get to a point where maybe this can be a feature of, uh, of, of, of their work. During the data fair, um, the majority leader and the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, I mean, when he was presented with some of the data and evidence from the constituency profile, one of the things that he told us was that, look, I mean, beyond members of parliament, he thinks that, I mean, members of the cabinet of our republic would need to see some of these data because of uh, how compelling uh, the data, I mean, is. And, you know, if you get to this level of interest, particularly at the very high level, I think you are on your way to ensuring uh, uh, sustainability. And then, um, as I indicated earlier, I mean, in previous work that we have done, uh, I can name two things that are now today part of the feature of, uh, of the work of our parliament that were project um, initiatives. The work with the Public Accounts Committee of our um, parliament, the annual post-budget workshop that uh, parliament does. These were all things that we started uh, as projects. And today, parliament has, uh, has picked them up because of the benefits that, uh, that have been uh, demonstrated. The work that we started with Star Ghana uh, to help Parliament set up a, a parliamentary training institute. Today, I think uh, the institute is there, it's, it's running. I mean, there is no single uh, uh, dollar or CD that is uh, coming from any donor. Now it's part of uh, the, the regular work of, of the Parliament of Ghana. So I think, uh, catch up to answer your question, uh, we have learned a lot of lessons from previous work that we have done uh, and we are very conscious that if you engage for just a year or two and disappear, then you are likely to disappear with uh, the, the, the kind of uh, benefits that you have created. But if you engage for a long haul and uh, you are able to get, uh, I think, um, a critical mass to appreciate the benefits of what is being done, there will be uptake in the end, and uh, your effort would continue even beyond the lifetime of the project. Thank you. Uh, Emily, I will continue to be to be available, but my colleagues from ASEPA, I think, are all online. So if there are any questions, of course, I mean, uh, this is a, a team effort. I mean, I'm just a figurehead, and I think uh, most of the work, as you know, you are part of the uh, the collaboration. I mean, most of the work I think is done by by my colleagues. So I think they are there uh, as part of the participants. And I believe uh, if my connection drops or uh, for any reason I'm not available, I think uh, some of them can step in uh, to respond to some of the, the questions that will be posed by participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rashid. Um, and also just to highlight to everybody that Verity has posted a link in the chat window to the learning that was shared at the midpoint of the of the DAP project. There was a learning report produced, and so do have a look at that. Um, now over to Omar um, for comments on the recent World Bank report, Data for Better Lives. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, so... Um... That comment, uh, we actually uh, were very excited to see that um, post by the World Bank uh, uh, on the 13th of July. Uh, I think it is important to reflect on what actually brought about that and how far we have come and why uh, the World Bank, for instance, is citing Ghana as uh, a good example of uh, strengthening uh, the data ecosystem. Now, with the outset of the SDGs, uh, what we did was to try to establish what we call uh, the national capacity assessment. Uh, so we, we, we undertook that in 2016, um, and that gave us the opportunity to reflect on what we need to do uh, to, to bring up 
the country to the point where we can adequately monitor progress in the SDGs. And we realized at the time that most of the data we need for monitoring the SDGs were not available. Uh, in some cases, uh, we had data, but that are not connected and, and, and that had challenges and, and some gaps that need to be plugged. And so we organized a data roadmap forum in April 2017 and came up with three key priorities. And the first priority was filling critical data gaps. The second priority was encouraging data use. And the third priority is strengthening the entire data ecosystem. Because within the ecosystem, we have many players beyond the National Statistical Office. So uh, for us to do and do this right, we have to uh, strengthen these other um, uh, players in. And so every program we are running today fit into at least one of these three priorities, including the DAP. The DAP project uh, uh, fit into all three. And, and, and systematically, we are not only providing the data to parliament, we are also working to strengthen the data systems themselves. And as we speak, for instance, we have, we have an established partnership with Statistics Denmark to harness and strengthen administrative data. And we're working on building uh, a data repository that becomes uh, a one-stop shop where uh, people can have access to data. And then we are working with other line ministries and other non-government agencies to build their data system in a way that we can leverage those data systems uh, to support uh, the country's growth because we under, with the understanding that even if all investments go into the National Statistical Office, we cannot provide the data needs of the country all by ourselves. So what do we do to leverage data, for instance, produced by think tanks? What do we do to leverage data produced by civil society organizations? So it is this entirety of activities that got the World Bank commending the work we are doing and, 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 and looking at it as an example. And we approach this without a basket of resources on the ground that we have to start with. We started, and then people saw uh, institutions and others saw uh, um, um, the value in the work we, we, we are trying to do, and then they came into support. And so with that, it means that even at the level where countries do not have all the resources, you can still make good of the systems you have and build a data ecosystem to the point where it can respond to the needs of the country. And I think these are some of the things the World Bank saw and so prepared uh, and published that uh, uh, blog on, on the three countries, including Ghana. So largely we are working in this space and I would not say we are there, we are in the process, but I believe we are making a lot of stride. We are, we are getting a lot of momentum by the day because we are encouraged by, for instance, this platform, we are encouraged by the fact that members of parliament on their own decided that, look, we want you to go out with us to help us do our work. We are encouraged by the fact that the majority leader, as uh, Dr. Rashid said, say, look, this should not only remain here, the executive need to uh, see this. We are encouraged by the fact that many more engagement by central government by ministers, by ministries, and by other technical bodies in the country see the need to have National Statistical Office engaged. And these are the things that build the data ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, I think one of the things I found most exciting for DAP as well when we started working on this project was that it seemed to hit a sort of simultaneous moment of uh, or window of opportunity in several different spaces at once and one of those was the uh, all of the thinking and the work that had been going on for a long time within the stat service and the stat system thinking about um the the capacities that were needed and and how to strengthen stats use and so on um and that seemed to coincide with a lot of thinking that had been going on for some time and through many different projects in parliament around how to use evidence better and how to strengthen capacity for stats and so on so one of the things that that 
um, is striking about DAP, I, I think uh, for me certainly is just the timing that the project managed to kind of start at, at that moment when there was all of this innovation happening both within the statistics system and then also within that, within Parliament. Uh, Dr. Zakaria, I think you had your hand up. Would you like to come in? Thank you, Amelia. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment on the issue of the sustainability, uh, as raised by Ketov. Uh, Dr. Rashid has, uh, you know, uh, indicated a lot on the sustainability. But one of the things I need to mention is that the collaboration that the 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 project has introduced is one of the things that we are carrying forward, even to the point that uh, the Parliament of Ghana has made it an activity in the strategy plan of 2020 to 2024, that we must collaborate. We must sign MOUs with almost all the think tanks, all the data generated institutions that we, we, we that are in this country, so that even at the end of this project, it means once we sign these MOUs, we'll continue to access information from, from, from you know, data generation uh, institutions. The second sustainability issue is the establishment of the uh, SDG DEX. Now, the institution of parliament has agreed that we should expand its you know, mandate. We should expand its mandate to cover all other data that, are, that we can have access to. And so we, we're going to have a budget line for that center that will continue to provide information for us. So what it means is that even at the end of the life of this project, all those activities will continue to, 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 you know, to, to strive. And I think that there, is, there are indications that uh, the project uh, purpose or whatever would be sustained uh, even when the project comes to an end. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Zakaria. Um, I wanted to ask um, one question of the of the other panelists and one question of the participants. Participants, I, ho I hope you don't mind. I've been seeing the names of people that are joining, and I know we have here a number of other people listening in who have worked specifically on evidence issues with parliaments. Uh, we have some people from other parliaments in the region here with us today and uh, colleagues who have been working on this issue of how Parliament relates with uh, other actors in the evidence system over a number of years and a number of different uh, projects. So would be interested to hear in the comments box um, any thoughts that people have about how DAP's experience com compares with yours, uh, any advice or questions, things that struck you um, that might be different about, uh, about what you've heard today. Um, so that would be my my sort of prompt for the participants uh, here. Be really interested to hear from you how, how this resonates with your experience of working on evidence relationships with parliaments uh, in the region. And then maybe while the participants are thinking about that, uh, a question for panelists, um, especially for yourselves, uh, Dr. Zachary and, and Omar. What, what did you find personally most surprising about DAP, about the, the work that you've undertaken so far in, in DAP? We know, uh, you know um, that Rashid has, has outlined, he framed it as a revolution in how parliament works um, and uh, the first sort of formal or institutional relationship between GSS and uh, and Parliament. So for you, uh, I know both of you have been champions of evidence use for a long time. You've been working on this issue across a number of different initiatives and with many different stakeholders. And uh, what did you find most surprising or striking about the, the relationship that has been underway through DAP? So um, if I should take it first, um, yes. Uh, uh, you know, when we started this project, it was uh, uh, a little worrying for some of us in terms of how Parliament itself would engage. Um, you, you realize that at the beginning, we had opportunity of uh, meeting with the parliamentary staff, but because of the timing, um, uh, uh, COVID and also um, uh, uh, the elections uh, in 2020 made it difficult for us to have Parliament 
fully engaged in this project. But you know, from the time we organized the data fair, that is from the 25th of May, of, of uh, May, yeah, of May, uh, to this point, it's so amazing how much progress we have made with the Parliament on this. Uh, and I recall we, we our meeting with the speaker was uh, um, early in April. And the speaker personally indicating that uh, he is happy to increase uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Parliament budget around data and evidence. And then immediately we had the data fair, having the speaker himself coming down there, having the majority leader coming down there. And immediately after we had opportunity of doing an orientation for members of parliament. And uh, the, uh, the orientation ended with uh, um, a member of parliament for the first time electing to be part of an orientation we're doing for uh, statistical service staff so that he was available to engage with the staff uh, for them to ask and understand how they work in parliament and how GSS can support their work. Then coming out of all that, parliament go their own way inviting GSS to come and do an orientation for them. And you know that this recent visit uh, by GSS, ASEPA, and, and Parliament to the Upper East region was not originally one of the activities we have tabled. But given the kind of momentum, Parliament decided that, look, we want to take the work beyond what we are doing in Accra. We want to take it to uh, the region. And for me, that was a surprise. And, and also being with the members of parliament and the commitment, the enthusiasm, the whole of the, the three days we spent in Upper East was great. And, and if you look at it from that perspective, it gives me a lot of uh, uh, comfort and, 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 and expectation that this is a program that has come to stay. And this is what I see uh, to be, for me, uh, the greatest achievement of this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Omar. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a really exciting to see across DAP. It's one of the things that tends to come up in, in project meetings and so on. We're talking about this project. It, it's always exceeding um, the initial expectations that it had around how to institutionalize uh, evidence use and how to build the relationship. And so exciting to hear these invitations and initiatives growing beyond the scope of, of what was initially in the, in the uh, project approach. Um, Dr. Zakaria, what was most surprising for you about the relationship with Ghana Stat Service? All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for me, coming from the research department, uh, when we started this project, what surprises me most was the kind of data that Saka Service has and how useful that data had been or would be for the use of parliament. And we were not aware because we didn't have that close collaboration with them. And so when we got closer, we noticed that there was so much that Sarkar Service has that could be of very good use to parliament that we didn't know. Even though they had all these and perhaps they are also not aware that we're also in need of that kind of data. And so when we discovered it, I was very excited and I know that that is a very good starting point. The second surprising thing was the technical assistance, not just the data, but the technical assistance that Skatika Service could give us in terms of training of our staff on how to handle their data. That was another surprising thing, because even though we are all researchers, sometimes it's difficult to pick a data from one side and be able to use it without actually being, you know, taking through how to use it. But that was what Skarska Service did for us. And I think that was another good thing that we, we picked on. Then finally, the enthusiasm with which the leadership of parliament embraced this project, I was also surprised because I, I initially was uh, afraid. I thought that probably our leadership will not even take a second look at the project. Uh, so we're trying to see how we can get them. We're doing all things. So how do we approach these guys so that they will understand what this project is all about 
so that they give us the, the, the head start. And so when we got there and then they embrace it, that was another surprising thing to me. But, and, and I hope that with these uh, things that with their uh, acceptance of the project and then their understanding of the importance of the project to parliament, then we're already halfway you know, through with success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had one other question um, in the chat window about um, how much do we know about usage of the resources that are being uh, produced by the partnership and uh, how we are measuring that. So I know uh, DAP is just still finalizing the final uh, the, the final learning product uh, at the end of phase one. So I'm not sure how much we might be able to say about that at the moment, but if anybody would like to pick that up, uh, uh, Omar or, or Dr. Zachariah or, or perhaps Agnes from, uh, from SAPA, if there's anything we can say about that. And then uh, we also have a comment in the chat window from Tumi, thanks Tumi, uh, flagging that there's a need for parliaments to make sense of the totality of evidence in order to make evaluative judgments about service delivery and hold the executive accountable. Um, thank you, thank you for feeding that in. And, and if you would like to, if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and uh, make a comment in the discussion, please do. Uh, it looks like Rashid might yeah. be picking up on the usage question first. Yes, Emily, can you repeat the question again? Let me just, uh, I about, didn't about think the connection use. was. So the question was. Yes, the last one. Has, I mean, that, yes. how, has the, how has the DAP project been tracking usage of the resources that were produced by the partnership? And how does it anticipate sustaining that usage? Well, I think uh, perhaps maybe uh, this 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 question might be better um, answered by by Dr. Zach, uh, since they are the they are the end users and beneficiaries of of whatever we we are producing. Uh, but let me just let me just uh, uh, perhaps use the, the most recent the most recent uh, activity that we have done uh, with one of the committees on on, on this. Uh, Along uh, generating data and so on, and getting them to feed into the the, the parliamentary process. Uh, as Omar said, I mean, we just came out of uh, of I mean, if you like, an evidence-taking activity uh, by the Poverty Reduction Committee, and one of the outputs of this is a statement that that uh, we are producing, so that this statement. Uh, would would be made on the floor of parliament uh, and then we'll get i mean uh, particularly the leadership of, of parliament uh, perhaps to begin to pay attention to some of the gaps that have been identified and maybe where resources are uh, are needed uh, perhaps those resources are provided through uh, the budget and we have the agreement of the the leadership of the committee but most importantly, I think uh, discussions are ongoing with the Speaker of Parliament uh, because he's informed at every stage about some of what we are doing, particularly in this project. So that at the end of it all, uh, if you have, I mean, this statement being admitted and then you have uh, perhaps a speaker and the leaders around it, then we could say that, uh, you know, at least um, some of the products are being are being picked up uh, and are ultimately uh, being used to inform the kind of decisions that are being made uh, in Parliament. Um, I don't know, perhaps maybe my colleagues can speak to uh, maybe other previous uh, examples, but I just thought I should pick up on this most recent one just uh, coming out of, out of the, the activity from last week. Yeah, maybe if I, 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 I can give a particular example um, uh, on this. Yeah, so if, if you look at um, the data value chain, uh, where you want data to move from uh, the production stage to the impact stage, where uh, a decision is made or a condition is altered, or someone's well-being is affected um, as a result of, 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 of data, 
you will realize that often uh, the data we produce within GSS in particular, uh, we end with the dissemination of the results. Uh, but for the entire value chain to be complete, we need to move to the point where uh, there's uptake and there's impact that, and we are directly involved in the measurement of the uptake and the impact. Now, whilst this example may not at the early stages be related to DAP, but then at the uptake level, DAP has come in. And that is basically around um, the first time Ghana produced the baseline SDG report uh, in 2018, where we try to assess the national budget and understand the allocations for the various SDG targets. And this work was done by the GSS, the Ministry of Finance, and the National Development Planning Commission. And as a result of that baseline, the Minister of Finance in 2019 issued um, a directive that no, no government agency takes money from the consolidated fund without linking it to the SDG target and without showing which specific SDG target that that money is going into. And, and that triggered an activity at the Ministry of Finance where they had to align all the uh, SDG targets with the, the chart of accounts that exists in, in the country. Then uh, we did the work further in, and, and we have currently published the third report uh, in 2020. Now, what happened is when we made a presentation during the orientation with members of parliament, and when we made uh, the colleague from Minister of Finance made a presentation of, to members of parliament to see how budget is allocated. And of course, it is also captured in the constituency profile. So how budget is allocated and the specific SDG targets that uh, local governments uh, assigned to specific budget uh, requests. Then the members of parliament said, look, this is an important piece that we need to take forward and go to the district and check what even informed the choice of specific SDG target for the budgetary allocation and what activities are implemented to ensure that these targets are achieved. And so you see that this is a direct because uh, uh, the data used get uh, uh, in, in, in impacted in the lives of people when it get to that stage where you would want to draw that linkage. And so if there would be an alteration uh, of the way budget is allocated as a result of this activity, then that is a great impact that has been made. And for me, that is one of the areas. And this is something that resources, it doesn't matter how much it is, can ever achieve if you do not get this kind of result. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Omar. Uh, really interesting discussion here today. Thank you to all the panelists. We are wrapping up now. We have two minutes left. So I'm going to put panelists on the spot and, and ask them just to share very quickly um, what you think, uh, by way of summing up, what has been most effective uh, about the DAP project in terms of institutionalizing evidence use. So we'll just have uh, one quick, quick comment from each of our panelists to close. And thank you very much to all of the participants as well for your questions. We hope that you'll look out for the learning products and, and uh, an experience that's gonna be shared by the project shortly. Um, uh, the links have been posted in the chat. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And just to hand over uh, one comment from, from Asapa, one from Dr. Zakaria, and one from Omar on this, what one thing to sum up is most effective about institutionalizing evidence use from the DAP experience? Omar, if would you I'm like missed. to go first? Okay, if oh, I may start. Yes, sure. Yes, uh, for, for me, for us, uh, coming from Parliament, uh, uh, one of the things that I will mention is the establishment of the SDG DEX. And uh, because we have already taken it up to expand it to include all the, the so that becomes an institutionalized, you know, thing that we have in the research plan. It's going to be, the DEX is going to be one of the units in the research department 
that will collaborate with all data generation institutions and will always have data around, even at, at the end of the project. Thank you very much, Dr. Zach. Omar. Uh, for me, it, it, it's more around the, um, the, the leadership buy-in of this engagement um, at the GSS. And, uh, and to exemplify that, um, that by the law, by the Statistical Service Law, we are to establish um, the National uh, 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 Advisory Committee of Producers and Users of Statistics, uh, which we did not envisage Parliament in the law, but based on this engagement, leadership and the board of GSS think that we need to have Parliament represented as part of the National Advisory Council of Users and Producers of Statistics. And for me, if there's anything that I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm so excited about, this is the fact that it provides us an opportunity to meet Parliament at all levels, for them to understand our need and for us to understand their needs as well. Thank you, Omar. Last words from Asapa. Rashid or Agnes, would you like to give a last word on behalf of ASAPA? Okay, I think we... Yeah, hello, are... Emily. Hi, Agnes. Please go Quickly, ahead. Um, this has already been said, but just to emphasize the buy-in of leadership and then also the contribution of the parliamentary service to the successes of DAP because we realize that you don't only need leadership, you don't only need MPs, but the role of the staff is very important and we are happy to continue supporting the research department and committees department to provide the support that they need to provide to MPs. Thank you. Thanks, Agnes. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Really interesting discussion. Thank you to the panelists for sharing your insights. Have a nice afternoon. Bye. Good day. Bye. Bye.